So welcome everybody uh, to our February Biostatistics uh, Seminar. And today we're, we're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Pei Hua Kui. You? Chu. Chu. Uh, from the University of Florida here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Uh, he, he actually got his doctoral degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in statistics back in 96. Um, and he, a he actually has a minor in computer science uh, as well from the University of Wisconsin. So that mix of skills is, is you know, proves very, very useful. And he did a lot of work in, in big data analysis as well. So um, after graduating, he, he was at the uh, Ohio State University uh, for a couple of years in, in the Biostatistics Center. And then he moved to one of my uh, alma maters at the University of Minnesota. And he was there up until uh, reaching full professor status, up until 2013, I guess. Uh, when he went to the University of Florida to take up the headship of the biostatistics department, which was, uh, he's the founding, founding uh, uh, head of that department. Uh, his areas of research really are sort of three major things that you can, you can look at. Uh, image processing, and something called non-parametric regression or jump regression analysis, and then statistical process control. He's been very, very active in, in all of these areas. He's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, a fellow of the IMS, and he's also the current editor of Technometrics, which is one of our you know, most famous journals in statistics. So today he's going to speak to us about uh, disease early detection and prevention by a dynamic scre disease screening system. So welcome. Okay. Is that here? Yes. Okay. I want to thank Sunil and the department for inviting me here. And, uh, it's, uh, glad, uh, I'm so glad to know that uh, your department and my department are quite similar. We both at uh, quite an early stage. And our department was created in uh, 2010. Same year? Or? Yeah. Okay. We are uh, based on two divisions. Uh, one division is at the College of Medicine, another division is at College of Public Health. Then the, the biostat group uh, people in those two divisions merged. Uh, in uh, 2010, then they spent about three years to recruit uh, a founding chair. So I became the founding chair after 15 years at Minnesota. And uh, uh, at Minnesota, I work at uh, School of Statistics. And uh, then I here at uh, Gainesville, I work at the Biostatistics. So quite often, people ask me, "What's the difference between stat and biostat?" <laughs> Uh, well, today you will, uh, in a minute, you will see the, 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 the slight difference. And uh, before I talk about today's topic, with, uh, which is on disease early screening, let me, since uh, most of you don't know me, so I, the first uh, three or four slides just to briefly discuss what I do uh, in the past 20 or 25 years. Uh, as a, did I block you? Okay. Yeah. As Sonia mentioned that I spent a lot of time uh, working on jump regression analysis. I work on that. That actually was my master thesis topic back in China. I was a, a, a master student since uh, from 86 to 89. At that time, uh, we each of us need to come up with a thesis topic. And uh, uh, I took a, a, a courses on uh, uh, on uh, non-parametric statistics, non-parametric regressions, and so forth. Then uh, in all those courses, we assume that the regression function should be continuous. So for example, uh, we all know, know a regression. Uh, at the beginning, we have linear regression models. According to Steve Stigler, for example, I asked him several times <laughs> about the history of, of, of linear regression. And he, told, he gave me evidences that uh, linear regression has at least 135 years of history, or more than that. But uh, in our daily basis, we all do consulting. So in consulting, linear regression and over those are still uh, the major uh, tools, statistical tools in, uh, used in daily basis. And then uh, we, uh, of course, those, this kind of models are too restrictive. They are mathematically convenient to use, but uh, quite restrictive. So we. Uh, generalize them to uh, parametric models, like a box. This is a box. This is a power transformation. But we can have a box cost transformation. We can ha have other parametric transformations. And then uh, in late 50s and early 60s, we have different kinds of non-parametric regression. We have kernel smoothing methods. We have smoothing splines, 
tree structure, so on and so forth. And all those regressions are in the category of non-parametric regression. Uh, basically, the regression function now, we don't put any parametric form on the regression function, but we still assume the regression function should be continuous, continuous curve or surface. And uh, so uh, when I was a master's student in 86, I asked myself why the regression function should be continuous. Can the regression function uh, have jumps or discontinuities? The, answers, uh, the answer is yes. We have many applications like that. One application I found at that time is the mine surface underground. You cannot see the mine surface, but uh, because of Earth's movement, so the mine surface often uh, split into several segments. And uh, when you uh, dig the mine or something like that, you are very, we are very interested in the, in, in the split location because the rate of accident will be much higher compared to other places. Okay, this is an example of two-dimensional regression models when the regression function has jumps. Then I s s started my research on that topic from scratch. As that I didn't know anybody else is working on that area or not, just to <laughs> do a research on that topic from zero and uh, keep doing this since then on. I use that as my PhD thesis at Wisconsin. Now I graduated a nine PhD myself, and some of those nine PhDs actually uh, that's their thesis topics. And uh, another uh, application of jump regression is image processing. This is uh, this, this is 3D image of our of our head, okay? And those three are the 2D uh, cross sections of the 3D images. Now let's talk about, for example, this 2D image. 2D. This 2D image actually can be re uh, described by this uh, regression model. Uh, X, I, Y, J denote I, J, S, pixel. We call the design points in computer science called the pixel, I, J, S, pixel. And this uh, regression function, they call the intensity function, which denotes brightness at each pixel, brightness, okay? And suppose we have noise, so this is the additive noise, then this observed the intensity level at I, J, S, pixel. This, this is my description of a 2D image. You see, this is a regression model, non-parametric regression model. The only difference from the conventional regression model is that this regression function is not continuous. For example, at the boundaries, we call the edges. At the edge positions, they are discontinuous. So uh, jump regression analysis is my tool to handle image uh, and, uh, and to do uh, image processing. And I started doing image processing since 1990s, so already uh, more than 20 years. And uh, I work on many different topics. Uh, here I list several topics. Image processing, just like statistics, it's a broad area. And uh, so I work on, for example, edge detection, which is to detect the edge positions. And image denoising, remove noise, recover signal. In engineering, we often need to remove noise, recover signal. And a blind image deblurring, if your image is blurred, you, when you take a, a picture, your camera moves a little bit, and your image is blurred. Uh, and you don't know the blurring mechanism. For example, the satellite image, the, the blurring is because turbulence, all these kind of things, and you never know the blurring mechanism. So uh, in that case, the blurring problem is called a blind image. The blind means you don't know the blurring mechanism. That's a tough, tough question, still uh, open, uh, in my opinion. And I spent a lot of time on that problem as well. Currently, I have one PhD student working on that topic. Image segmentation, which you want to, for example, segment to the foreground from the background or something like that. And uh, image registration is a hot topic right now in medical image and uh, many other areas. Basically, suppose we uh, the, uh, the bring to my patient, take pictures, for example, at this spot this week, Next week, take another picture at the same spot. We want to see whether the tumor grows or shrinks, okay? But before we can do that, you need to match up those two images first. Otherwise, the comparison does not make any sense. Because comparison, we ask the computer to compare <laughs> instead of just look at the two pictures by ourselves. It's to geometric match up uh, two or more images, that's called image registration. And nowadays, we can take 3D images. 10 or 15 years ago, in computer science, we have a research topic called image reconstruction. That means we cannot get 3D images. All the objects are 3D. 
but we cannot get the 3D image. So we can take a sequence of 2D images and to recover the, the, the pictures of 3D, that's called image reconstruction. Nowadays, we can get 3D images, okay? So that image reconstruction area seems it will disappear quite soon. And then how to analyze 3D images uh, efficiently? That's a kind of big data already, 3D, <laughs> because you have X, Y, Z now. Uh, MRI image, if uh, MRI images. And uh, if you want to know, for example, how a uh, jump regression analysis can be used, uh, applied to image processing, what's the differences, connections, so on and so forth, then this is a review paper. It's a good, good resource. And then I, I have a monograph on that topic. This is the first, first book on jump regression analysis. And, uh, and uh, there are several chapters on image processing, several chapters on uh, uh, jump regression analysis. And I discussed the connections and the differences. Uh, between those two uh, uh, areas. Uh, as uh, Sonia mentioned that I spent uh, many years on quality control as well. Uh, actually, after I moved to Minnesota in 1998, I spent a lot of time, uh, most of my research time is on this static process control. Static process control is use, used uh, in almost all factories. <laughs> uh, is, it's a major statistical tool to monitor a process, pro, like production process, production line or something, to make sure that it works stably, all the products are good products. And uh, actually, uh, this kind of process can be a production line, can also be medical systems, like uh, operation of a hospital, uh, uh, like uh, can also be, for example, the pollution for, used for pollution control and environmental monitoring, and it, disease syndromic uh, surveillance, and uh, which I will discuss uh, this last uh, topic today. And uh, I just published a book, so if you are interested on that topic, uh, this is probably is a good uh, resource on uh, SPC. And uh, also, in the past about uh, 10 years, or more, a little bit more than 10 years, uh, 12 or 13 years, I also work on the following survival analysis problem. The two, th those are the two hazard curves, estimate hazard curves. They cross each other. And uh, I started uh, uh, work on this problem, crossing uh, hazard uh, problem, uh, because one day I visited one of my friends who is a PhD statistician working at a big hospital. And on his desk, I saw this picture. And then I asked the story behind this picture. He told me that, uh, well, this picture is uh, for a clinical trial uh, to investigate whether this uh, zinc nasal spray, which is a treatment, is effective in curing common cold. So in that trial, they recruited two groups of patients. One group of patients used that treatment, and another group of patients used uh, treatment, uh, placebos. Okay? And then they follow each patient for about two weeks because for, com for cold, even you don't take any treatment, you, you, usually you will be recovered in two weeks. So uh, every day they uh, measure certain, about a dozen uh, code symptoms, and then they have a clear definition uh, of the event that the code is recovered, okay, based on those dozen uh, symptoms. And so the event here is that the co common code is recovered. That's a good event here. And then uh, we ha those two are the two estimated hazard curves. So if one curve is above the other or something like that, then people know how how to compare them, log rank test, all those tests. But in this case, the two curves cross each other. So I asked my friend, uh, what's your conclusion here? He said that the conclusion is um, based on SAS programs, S plus, at that time, R is not that popular yet. So based on those uh, existing uh, algorithms uh, or uh, procedures in SAS and S plus, he said that they concluded that the treatment is not significantly effective. Uh, at uh, as, as that time, their paper actually is already accepted. The next year, actually, uh, I visited my friend in year uh, uh, 2000, and then next year, that paper got uh, published, actually. Then I told my friend immediately that uh, your analysis may not be appropriate, <laughs> because uh, I'm a consulting manager. I do consulting on a daily basis at Ohio State. I create they created a brand new biostat center at that time. I was the first uh, consulting manager over there. I worked for two years and every day I consulted with different medical doctors. 
And uh, I got uh, qu quite often I got so-called five-minute questions from so many different guys, people. And uh, in this, so I know SaaS and S plus well, and I know that in those uh, existing software packages, uh, people use log rank all those existing tests don't take care of the crossing pattern. Basically, they were estimated the two hazard curves and computed their differences at the different time points, then accumulate all the differences, add them up. If you add all them up, positive difference and negative difference will be canceled out, right? So make the treatment difficult to, to, uh, uh, to be significant. But actually, if you analyze this kind of data properly, the story can be in a different, uh, 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 differently, and the story can be even uh, more interesting. In this case, means that the treatment, you, uh, as I mentioned, the event is a good event here. So above the, the curve higher means means better. Okay. So the treatment actually is is quite effective before the crossing point, about six days. In the first six days, actually treatment is quite effective. We compare the, the treatment and the placebo before six days, and it's, it's significant. And, but after six days may not be that significant, uh, although in the plot it looks quite different, but uh, most data are censored data, not the complete data, censored already. So here, after the crossing point, you cannot tell the difference already. So you see, many uh, medical treatments, actually their, 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 their effect is Different, in different time periods, the, 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 the impact, the effects are different. Like a cancer treatments, are, like uh, for example, surgery. Surgery usually is effective in long run, but uh, in the first uh, period of time, probably the risk even will increase the risk, right? Because of a lot of uh, different reasons. So uh, after that, I spend a lot of time working on uh, that uh, uh, crossing, how to compare to crossing hazard curves. Okay, I have two PhD students graduated with uh, that thesis, uh, use that as a thesis topic. Now today's uh, uh, topic is about disease early screening and uh, prevention. That should be, sounds like an interesting and important topic. And uh, I have this motivating example, and uh, this is a famous uh, study. This is the Shea Framingham uh, Heart Study of the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute. And actually, in the, in the entire world, there are many such similar studies. The major purpose is to try to figure out the major risk factors of heart disease, okay, uh, cardiovascular disease. What's, what are the major risk factors? And uh, uh, in this study is used that name because they recruited many residents in that town at uh, MA. And based on that study and many other studies, we already figured out many major risk factors of cardiovascular disease, like high blood pressure, total cardiac levels, smoking, obesity, so on and so forth. But the question is, after we figure out the major risk factors, what's next? Can we, based on the observed observations of the major risk factors, to early detect disease? or to predict disease, and uh, in order to prevent a disease before it occurs. Can we do that? That's my question. That's the motivation why I uh, study this topic. I try to use the identified risk factors to uh, detect disease as early as possible, okay? And uh, I call this problem, uh, I gave a name called a dynamic screening problem. Dynamic means, uh, here means, uh, has two meanings. Yes. Dynamic means uh, I want to use, combine two, uh, two comparisons. One is when we, each time when we uh, diagnose whether a person got that disease, we need to compare the person's risk factor readings, observations with uh, the, the readings of certain healthy people, cross, uh, cross sectional comparison, right? We need to do this. Actually, the doctors are doing that. Each time when we take the blood pressure readings, doctors say your blood pressure is too high, compare with certain number. Where came from that number? That number actually is a kind of confidence interval, the, the, the upper level of the confidence, come from the healthy people. That's a cross uh, sectional comparison. And I also want to make use of all the history data of that person and all other persons. I want to combine those, both of them. 
combine the cross-section comparison, and I want to make use of all history data. That type of screening, I call it dynamic screening. So dynamic has two, sen two different senses. One is the cross-section comp comparison. Another one is the, uh, the using uh, the history data. And this kind of dynamic screening problem actually is very popular in practice, not just to, uh, to uh, pre predict the disease. Uh, for example, uh, many uh, products like airplanes cars are checked regularly or occasionally about certain variables related to their quality and performance. Each airline, each airplane, after it arrived at a city, engineers will check many indices, right? And then uh, if we are not lucky, the airplane will, the air, the, 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 the flight will be delayed or something like that. So if those indices are, are not, not good, it means they all, we already compare with the, 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 the indices of well-behaved airplanes, right, of the same age or something like that, cross-sectional comparison. But I also want to make use of all the hatred of the, of this airplane. So that's another example of a, a dynamics screening problem. And if the observed value of a product are significantly worse than the values of a typical well-functioning product of the same age and other risk fun, uh, factors, then some adjustments or interventions should be, uh, should be made to avoid some unpleasant consequences. That's the, that's the problem here. Now, uh, to how to solve the dynamic screening problem? Do we have existing methodologies? Right? Okay, let's, let's see whether we have existing methods. The first uh, the method we can think of is longitudinal data analysis. Because data are longitudinal, each airplane, we observe the airplane longitudinally over time. So uh, we can construct, for example, confidence intervals of the mean responses by longitudinal data analysis, confidence intervals. Then if a specific person's uh, blood pressure reading uh, exceeds the upper level of the confidence interval, then we say that is that person. Uh, you need to be careful. You need to uh, go to see a doctor or something like that. That's the, that's the longitudinal data analysis. But this method uses the cross-sectional comparison, as I mentioned. Basically, it compares other healthy people. Uh, it doesn't make use of all the history data of the subject. At, at this time point, you take the blood pressure and compare with the confidence interval bound. Didn't make use of, did, the doctor don't care how you behave or how, what's your health situation in the past about 10 years or something like that. And it cannot detect shift sequentially, okay? I want to uh, make use of all the uh, history data and uh, try to detect the, the, any kind of shift sequential. Now, another uh, existing methodology uh, is the statistical process control I just mentioned. Sequen statistical process control is a sequential monitor production line. Here, each patient is a product, is a line, is a, a process. Okay, we can regard each patient as a process. So we can make each, uh, we can, uh, we can monitor each, uh, monitor each uh, subject sequentially by using statistical process control method. No problem. Uh, by using this method, we can make use of all history data of the subject. Uh, but uh, statistical process control uh, treat each person as a process. So it, uh, uh, it, they monitor subjects separately and it cannot compare different subjects. Because each person is a process. So we just keep monitoring that process. Basically, it detects shift in the way that it compares the current observation with all the history data. It didn't do comp uh, cross-sectional comparison. Okay. And the process mean and the variance function, by using the conventional SPC method, the mean and the variance should be constant if the process is so-called in control. Process is good, then mean and the variance should be constant. But uh, in reality, uh, the mean and the variance may not be constant even when the subject, for example, patient, is actually quite healthy. Uh, right? When we got older, even <laughs> we are still quite healthy, but our blood pressure will uh, keep changing uh, over, over, over time. So we cannot use the existing SPC methods either to, to, to solve this problem. And then um, I uh, try to combine those two methodologies, combine those two. Combine the longitudinal data analysis with the uh, uh, statistical process control. Okay, combine them and uh, to achieve my research goals. 
So I uh, proposed this method called a dynamic disease screening system. When I apply this system on uh, disease monitoring, I call that this name, but I can use this method actually for other purposes, as I mentioned, to, for example, monitor airplanes and, and other products. Now, uh, this system uh, consists of three major, major steps. Three major steps. The first step is to estimate regular longitudinal pattern from in-control data, from a pool of healthy people's data, observations. Blood pressure, as I mentioned, we have so many uh, data, uh, existing data sets. Okay, we do have th uh, those data sets. And uh, based on the, the, the in-control data sets, we try to estimate regular longitudinal patterns. Okay, then for a new person, for a new person came, we want to monitor a new person we standardize the observations of a new subject to monitor. Standardized by minus the estimated mean of the regular uh, longitudinal pattern divided by standard deviation. By doing this kind of stand uh, standardization, we are doing cross-sectional comparison already. We are comparing with the, uh, the, the healthy people already, cross-sectional comparison. That's the second step. Third step is to monitor the standardized observations by a control chart. Now, I've got the standardized data, we sequentially monitor the standardized data. Okay, in that way, I combine, you see, I combine a cross-sectional comparison with sequential monitoring, right? Okay. And uh, uh, this, uh, in my opinion, this is a new area, and uh, we uh, wrote three papers only. Uh, uh, the first paper will appear in Technometrics uh, in the next issue, May, May issue. Since I, now I became, that paper was handled by previous editor, but now I, I'm the editor, so I arranged the, the, the lineup of each issue, so I know that this will appear in May issue. And then uh, we have, this is a universal case, so we monitor only one index. And uh, uh, motivated case, that's still in the review. And then motivated case, we, uh, how to, uh, to, to do non parametric regression analysis of motivated longitudinal data, that problem itself. In motivated case, how to estimate the motivated mean function non parametrically that problem itself is actually quite a new research topic. So we wrote another uh, paper published in Statistica a couple of months ago. Now let me uh, briefly uh, describe each step. Remember my procedure has three steps. Now let me uh, describe each of those three steps in a little bit more uh, details. Uh, the first step, remember, suppose we have in control data, means uh, we have uh, uh, observations of a group of healthy people's data, okay? Uh, in, in reality, we have a lot of such data sets. And uh, suppose we have uh, M, little m, well-functioning subjects, okay? M. And each subject, for example, we have th this Y. So for simplicity, I will only focus on universal case. But as I mentioned, we do uh, have papers on motive, motive case, universal case. Then each subject, we have uh, capital J observation. But this J can depend on I, can depend on I. I will make it a J, it's just for simplicity. In the paper, we say the J I instead of J. And uh, so this is the mean, uh, in control mean, and this is the variance. And, uh, but the longitudinal data usually, uh, for at the different time points, usually observations are correlated, right? Okay. So the error term, you cannot assume them uh, IID at the different time points. We need to assume that the error term actually consists of two parts, epsilon zero and epsilon one. Epsilon zero denote confound risk factors that are not included in our model, but uh, may affect the response, right? So uh, that's, uh, we often, uh, as a statistician, we often include the error term in our, random error term in our model. But uh, where came from the error? <laughs> when I wrote my first, uh, first book, uh, I, I consider that, I spent a lot of time considering that, that problem. In my opinion, actually that's probably also many other people's opinion. The major resource of the error term is, is from, the, from many risk factors that uh, they may affect the response, but uh, they are not included in the model. Some variables we d we are not aware of their, their existence. Some variables we are aware of their existing, but difficult to measure or something like that. Okay, that's epsilon zero. That's the major source contribute to the error term. 
And that's also the source caused the, the autocorrelation within each subject. And then uh, epsilon 1 is the pure measurement error. For epsilon 1, you can assume at the different time points they are independent of each other. Okay. And so the variance function, variance function uh, equals V0 ST for any two positions S and T, two times S and T. V0 is the variance function of epsilon 0, actually this one. And the sigma 1 square is the va variance of epsilon 1 at a specific time point S. Okay, because at the different time points, this one uh, are independent of each other, so we have an indicator function here, right? Okay, then universal case, how to estimate now the, as I mentioned, the regular longitudinal pattern is described by the mean function and also the variance function. So next I need to estimate the mean function and the variance function from the observation, from the observations. And in universal case, there are already exist, many existing discussions on that topic. How to estimate it, mu and the variance. And for example, those people already uh, discussed that problem. So based on their methods, we can estimate the mu. So we got the mu hat and we got the uh, sigma square hat y. Okay, we can get those estimates. But as I mentioned, in motivated case, actually that's an open problem when we uh, study that problem uh, 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 two or three years ago. Motivated case, that's an open problem. So we wrote a paper published in Seneca. And before I wrote that paper, I'm not very sure that the problem is open or not, so I asked several uh, friends on longitudinal data, including uh, Yao Fang at uh, Toronto, who is a Hans Mueller, and also I asked Hans Mueller, those guys, I, I want to be certain that open still uh, no existing papers on those topics, and all those people told me, no, they haven't found any existing papers on in motivated case, how to estimate the motivated mean and the motivated uh, covariance matrix function. Uh, so then we uh, developed our own methods. So that's the first step, how to estimate the regular longitudinal pattern. Uh, regular longitudinal pattern is described by the in-control mean function and the in-control uh, covariance function. Okay, we already did that. Now suppose we have a new person came and we want to monitor that new person. So we have a new subject. And that subject, we uh, follow that uh, new subject, and, uh, and suppose that new subject, uh, its y value are observed at t1 star, t2 star. Those t's could be different from the t's in the in-control case, because, so I put a star here, okay, over that uh, interval. And then if that person is also in control, that person should follow uh, the, the model I just described, should follow this model, if, that, if the new person is in control, everything is healthy. And that person's why why res the response should follow that model. Okay, so I write that model slightly differently. I just uh, uh, this is the original. This is the error term, and I just write split the standard deviation and with this uh, epsilon. This epsilon now variance equals one. I just make the, the standard deviation outside. Okay for simplification of the, of the uh, standardization step. And then I do the standardization. Standardization just minus the mean divided by standard deviation. Okay? As I mentioned, by doing that, we are doing the cross-sectional comparison. Right? Okay, no problem. So the second step is very easy. Just like uh, 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 z-test, right? Minus the mean divided by standard deviation. Now, the next step is to do sequential monitoring. After you standardize the observations of a new subject, now we want to sequentially monitor the standardized observations sequentially. How to do that? Remember, if the person, if the person is in control, if, if the, that person, new subject, is in control, the mean of epsilon zero should be close to zero. And a standard deviation should be close to one. Right? Okay. If you further assume the response of y, oops. Sorry. If you further assume that the response y has a normal distribution, then uh, this epsilon, uh, the standardized data should be approximately uh, normal zero one or something like that. Okay. So now let's do sequential monitoring. Okay. So uh, let's assume that the observations, observations, let's discuss the simpler case. Simpler, uh, 
uh, simplest case is that the observations are independent and normally distributed. When we do research, we often started from the simpler case. Of course, I'm not satisfied with this case. In reality, not really, uh, the normality is always an issue. <laughs> Independence, so this is a time series. Uh, this is a time series, and quite often there is autocorrelation, all these kind of autocorrelations. So, but uh, we often started from the simpler case. And uh, in this simpler case, the standardized observations will be IID, uh, asymptotically IID with the in control distribution, in control distribution normal zero one, as I mentioned. Okay. Now, also the observation times, T, TJ stars. Observation times, in time series analysis, we often assume they are equally spaced. But in reality, for example, when we take the blood pressures, when we visit the clinics, the observation times could be uh, unequally spaced. <laughs> then I ask many experts in time series, analy time series analysis, I said, do you have uh, good methods to do uh, time series analysis when the uh, observation times are unequally spaced? I also spent a lot of time searching on the, lit the, the literature so on and so forth. Actually, uh, this problem is tough for them, and uh, there are s some existing research, but not many. And uh, this will be uh, my next research topic as well. And uh, I already arranged, uh, organized a group of people work on that. Even for time series analysis, when the observ observation times are e unequally spaced, how to do time parametric, for example, ARIMA models, or, or this kind of models. That problem itself is already very tough and uh, mostly open problem. Although that problem is a very, uh, very uh, important problem, right? Right now, most people uh, focus on the so-called uh, small, small, uh, small and large P and high dimensional data problem because those problems in reality, they are important. But actually in statistics, there are many other important problems like this kind of time series analysis. <laughs> Not many people pay attention to those. Okay, so, uh, Let's first assume that the observation times are equally spaced. Then this is a typical uh, SPC problem. Then we can use the standard conventional control chart as usual. Conventional control chart is the control chart that looks like this. Suppose this is a cumulative sum, Q sum chart. Okay. Uh, suppose we want to detect upward uh, shift, the mean, for example, shift upward. In, in this, this kind of applications, we are mostly concerned about upward shift because we are talking about blood pressure, this kind of things, upward shift. To detect upward shift, we can use cumulative uh, sum control chart. Cumulative sum, basically, this is the standard observations. And so use a cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, information, you see, cumulative information. And, uh, but at the same time, if the history data didn't provide much information about the hypothesis, we try to forget the history data as, as much as possible. So there is a trade-off. On one hand, we try to make use of the history data. On the other hand, we try to throw away the history data. Okay, so this is uh, the, 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 those are the ideas behind the cumulative sum. Okay, Q sum chart is uh, has some uh, optimality properties. Uh, uh, it already been approved that uh, uh, if the, all those standard uh, assumptions are valid, then the Q sum chart, the, the 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 it will detect any shift mean shift uh, fattest, the, the average ring length, which I will probably uh, introduce in a minute, that's a criteria to, to measure its performance, uh, will perform the best. That's the kind of QSAN control charting statistic, CJ star, okay, this J is the current time point. And if this uh, charting statistic uh, value uh, is bigger than a threshold value we call the control limit, then it will give us a signal. Give a signal. signal means then uh, it, it indicates that the process has some problem up to time j. There, there is a significant upward shift. The process should be stopped if, uh, if we want to use it to pl monitor uh, production line. And then after the signal, of course, we need to go back to check the root cause. What's the reasoning behind uh, uh, this uh, signal? Now, the performance of QSAN chart uh, we often use so-called in-control average ring length ARL0 and out-of-control uh, average ring length ARL1. 
ARL0 is similar to type 1 error probability. Basically, it's defined as when the process is in control. Uh, ARL average ring length is the average number of observations or average amount of time from the starting point of the monitoring to the signal time if the process is in control. Even the process is in control, we can still give signal, false, false signal, right? So, of course, ARL zero short means better, right? Similar to type one error probability. And the outer control ARL, ARL one is when the process, for example, has a shift occurred at a certain time point. Then the average amount of time from the occurrence of the shift to the signal, so that's the, the average amount of time, that's called uh, out of control ARL. Out of control ARL, of course, shorter means better. Okay, so similar to type 1 error probability and the type 2 error probability, although in this business there is a time involved, it's a sequential, there is a time involved. So we need to talk about the length, time length. And uh, in, uh, but uh, similar to type 1 error probability and type 2 error probability, although we, uh, this one bigger means better, this is small means better, but there is no free range. So in this business, we often uh, prefix or pre-specify ARL0 at a certain level, and then let the ARL1 uh, smaller, as small as possible. Okay, so uh, now how about uh, when the times are unequally sp spaced. When the times are unequally spaced, those criteria are already not, not reasonable, unreasonable to use. Here we are only talk about the amount, for example, the, the average number of observations from the starting point to, to the signal, for example, ARL0, ARL that's the average number of observations. But if the times, observation times are unequally spaced, if you only count the number of observations, that uh, does not make uh, much sense. So those criteria all need to be modified. And how to modify those criteria? Uh, we came up with some new criteria. So uh, first we introduced so-called a basic time unit. The observation times are in equal space. So we first introduced basic time. Basic time units are the largest time units that all observation times are integer multiples of, of that basic time units. Suppose we are talking about the, the times to visit the clinic, then basic, one obvious basic time unit is day, each day, which date, uh, which day you visit the clinic, something like that. In some application, maybe hour is a basic time unit, so on and so forth, okay? And then uh, the, the NJ, uh, Suppose this Tj star is the Js observation time in the original scale, then Tj star divided by omega is the Nj star. This Nj star is the number of observation in the basic, in the basic time unit omega. Okay? So you see, now I transform the original observation times to the, to, to, to the, to the observation times in basic time unit. After I introduce that basic time units, then each basic time unit, they are equally spaced, <laughs> right? I should have given a toy example here, but uh, uh, quite unfortunately, I, I forgot. Then uh, I introdu we introduced so-called in-control average time to signal. Instead of use in-control average ring length, here we use average time to signal, defining in the following way. If a signal is given at little s, little s observation time in basic time unit, then uh, ns star, the average ns star measures the in control average time to signal. That's ats zero. And uh, similarly, we define so-called ats one. All those are the average time to signal in basic time unit. Okay. Then, as uh, uh, similar to ARL zero and AI one. We let ATS0 uh, prefixed at a certain level, and then this one smaller means better. And uh, probably I should uh, uh, skip some uh, slides. And then uh, how to choose some uh, in my procedure in the QSAN charts, there are two parameters. One is the constant K, smoothing parameter. I don't know whether you notice that the K or not. Let me go back to the QSAN chart. Actually, there are two parameters. One is the parameter k. That's called allowance, uh, allowance constant. This is a kind of smoothing parameter. 
Another one is the threshold value. No, there are two parameters in the Quezon chunk. How to, how to choose those two parameters? Usually, k is prefixed, determined first. Then this law is chosen such that the pre-specified AR ATS zero value is achieved. Okay. Then, uh, if ATS zero is given, then law is given. But we still need to discuss how to choose k. These parameters. I have several slides on that, but those are quite detailed material. So probably I want just want to skip. So that uh, that. Uh, a table is about the selection of k or something like that, uh, the low values of low. If the ATS zero, for example, is given, given k is given, then uh, ATS zero given k is given, then the low value, for example, this is the low equals point point nine two nine. If ATS zero is equals twenty, if ATS zero is uh, fifty, then low value is one point eight four four something like that. Okay, low is determined by ATS zero, k is prefixed. And uh, then how to determine k, there is a, those are detailed uh, materials are discussed in, in our papers. And uh, so far, we assume that observations are independent of each other. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but in practice, uh, time series data, there could be autocorrelations. Right? And uh, then how if, uh, uh, as I mentioned, if the observation times are in unequally spaced, how to do time series analysis. That problem in itself is a very challenging problem. So uh, we, we can only do this kind of time series analysis in AR1 case. AR1 case. Okay. Now, uh, suppose we use AR1, consider AR1 case. This is the AR1 models. And the TIJ is the original observation times. And uh, this is the uh, basic time unit. This is the current, time, uh, current observation. So the, 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 the error epsilon at the current time point depend on the, the epsilon at the previous time in the basic time unit. That's the AR1 model. Okay. Now, but this, uh, this Tij minus omega, there may not be observations at, at that specific time point. At that specific time point. So we need to express this model in terms of the original observation times. So already quite complicated. If we uh, express this model in, t in the original in the original time point, you see, original in the original times, those are the original time t i j t i j minus one the previous observation. Those are the original in original times. That one is in the basic time unit. How to express this in the original times? Well, we can do that in AR one mod in AR one case. This model can be. Uh, uh, expressed in that way, but this uh, those the phi is the is the lag operator, but this uh, delta i j minus is already quite complicated formulas. Okay, but we can still do it. You can forget all those details. If you are interested, you can read the papers. I just want to mention, you don't need to remember all those because they're quite tedious. And then uh, AR still AR one models, and we can. Uh, uh, minus the mean, as I mentioned, the standardization, right? Divided by standard deviation. And then uh, we need to estimate, uh, estimate this phi. Phi is the, in the AR1 model, this is the coefficient. How to estimate the coefficient? Uh, we uh, use this, this kind of uh, least square procedure to estimate the phi. Okay. And then we need to do a sequential monitoring. Sequential monitoring. Uh, we standardized so sequential monitoring. Suppose there is a new individuals observation times like this. AR, if it's in control, follow the AR1 model. So the new individual follows that models. The error term follows that model, and then we expressed in the original times, and then and then the control chart looks. We can still construct control chart, but the control chart already looks charting statistics already looks very complicated. AR1 case. Okay, and uh, then the charting statistic bigger than special value it gave us a signal. And uh, of course, AR1 model. Uh, although in SPC, most people, if the observations are correct, most people use AR1 model. But uh, AR1 model in many cases may not be valid. How about uh, AMA models, ARIMA models, so on and so forth? And uh, very difficult to handle. And uh, that's still open problem. But in our paper, in our paper. We use the original Qsan chart 
But for general, uh, for general situations, if it's correlated, it's not normally distributed, we adjust the control limit low based on, the, based on in control data. We have a numerical algorithm. If you give me an in control data set, I don't need to know how the data is correlated, whether the data, what's the distribution, in control distribution. I can use a numerical algorithm to compute, use a bootstrap or something like that, based on in control data, to compute the control limit of the original uh, Q, uh, conventional QSAR chart. And uh, that chart can be applied in a general, very general situation, but may not be efficient because we didn't uh, make use of the distribution uh, information and so forth. Uh, simulations, uh, we started at, uh, yes, eight minutes. So let me skip those simulations. Yeah, simulations, uh, basically just to say that our methods are good, basically. <laughs> 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 That's the simulation. Now let's uh, g come back uh, to this example. Uh, Shea Framingham uh, has study. This is a this is a big study and a lot of data. I only focus a, s a small uh, portion of the of the entire data set. In that small portion, we are concerned about uh, stroke, stroke. And in the data set we have, uh, there are uh, 10, 28 non-stroke patients. Okay, and each patient uh, we have longitudinal data like high blood pressure, cholesterol level, all those we have up. And each patient have uh, seven observations over time. And uh, on, uh, have observations on many uh, major risk factors of uh, stroke. And uh, in the data set, we have 27 stroke patients. And we treat them as a new subject to monitor. Okay, we treat those non-stroke patients as our in-control data to estimate the the, the, the in-control uh, regular longitudinal pattern. And each patient was followed seven times. Okay, so J equals seven. And uh, in, this, uh, in, in this example, we uh, only use uh, one uh, response, one risk factor, which is the total cholesterol level. And as I mentioned, we have a pa another paper use a multiple uh, response. And uh, the solid, solid line here is the estimated mean function, mu hat, based on the in-control data. Okay, by, based on, by using longitudinal data analysis. That's the mu hat, mean, mean estimate. And uh, the, the bold uh, dashed lines are the point-wise confidence interval, 95% confidence intervals. Okay? Yes. And then there are 27 uh, very thin uh, lines denote the observations. Curve, I think, has each. seven observations, so we connect them by lines. So each person is a line. So there are 27 lines. Uh, those are the corresponding to uh, 27 uh, stroke patients. So uh, if those patients see doctors, doctor will use those comfy intervals to make a diagnosis. Doctor will say that among those 27, there are six of them. Six of them, their observations exceed th that upper, upper, uh, upper bound. So if the doctor use comfy interval to do diagnosis, doctor will say, will, will diagnose six out of 27 as a, as a uh, stroke patients, or the patients that were likely to have stroke or something like that. Use the confidence interval formula. Now uh, we use sequential monitoring, and uh, first step we estimate mu and sigma. Go oh? Go back one second. So given that you're allowing any T star, any T star, yeah. Don't you want to use a joint confidence interval or simultaneous like confidence interval rather than point wise? This is the cross-sectional one, right? right. This is a cross-sectional one. Yeah, he's, he's giving a cross-sectional example of, of what it would be. Right, no, no, I understand. I understand, yes. but could you not adjust those? I don't, I, I didn't adjust. Okay. Yeah. okay. Here I didn't adjust. Okay. Yeah. If we adjust, probably it will, it will be narrow or something. Right. Yeah, it will be narrow. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, to do the, I see this is a point-wise right. Yes, okay. And then uh, to use my methods, uh, first step is to estimate mu and sigma. I already estimated uh, and uh, presented in the previous, sli uh, previous slides. And uh, the second step is to, uh, for a new person, we standardize, do the standardization minus the mean divided by standard deviation, as I mentioned. Then uh, in this data set, we uh, justify that uh, AR1 model probably is OK. So we use the AR1 model for standardized observations and estimate the phi is 
quite a strong uh, autocorrelation. And we use a goodness of fit test to, 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 to check whether the AR1 model is appropriate. And it, uh, now uh, let me briefly uh, mention the, 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 this kind of justification. Uh, in my opinion, this kind of justification is very important. Um, I'm, since I'm an editor, so I read many papers. I read uh, almost every, every day I need to read one or two papers. Many people just uh, uh, have a data set and uh, propose a model and uh, apply the mass, propose the method to the data set and then explain the results. That's all. You have to accept it. <laughs> That's my results. In my opinion, you need to at least tell people whether those models are appropriate or, or not to describe the data set. Quite often, high dimensional data, linear model. The people don't care whether the linear model is, up, is good or not. And uh, if you uh, s submit this kind of paper to Technometrics, uh, usually I will ask authors to at least you need to give me some kind of justification. If you don't have a theoretical justification, you can even use uh, graphical justifications or something like that. Okay, at least to do some justifications. So here our justification is just to perform a goodness of fit test. P value is about one. And uh, in the QSAN chart, uh, those parameters, I actually skipped the some uh, slides, so you may not uh, be clear about their meanings. Basically, ATS0 should be fixed, 25. Here, the basic time unit is a year, one year, 25 years. If that means ATS0 equals 25 means if, there is, if the person is healthy, in control, then, but our procedure can still give signal then the average time to signal on average will be 25 years. We thought that's already good enough. Okay. And then those are the 27 control chart for the 27 people. And uh, for example, this, this, this chart, there is a, a dotted horizontal line. That's the control limit. And uh, there is a curve here. There is a curve. That curve is the charting statistic. If the charting statistic exceeds that horizontal line, that means it will give a signal. Each time when it exceeds the horizontal line, it will give a signal. That means the person should be diagnosed as a stroke patient, or that the person is likely to have a stroke. And among those 27 uh, uh, plots, how many signal? How many people got signals? 22 out of 27 people will got uh, signals. And if we use the confidence interval I mentioned, the six out of 27 people will uh, got signals. And uh, you may ask me, uh, for diagnosis, we talk about sensitivity and specificity. And for cases, for 27 stroke patients, you got this many signals. How about the, the, the healthy people, non-stroke patients? We got 131 uh, uh, signals out of uh, 1028. So that's, this is about sensitivity, this is about specificity. Again, here we only use one index. If we use more index, then uh, those can be improved a little bit. And uh, I, so uh, today I just to tell you the kind of idea, the take home message is just the idea that I try to combine longitudinal data analysis with sequential monitoring, combine those two. I create, uh, cre uh, propose a new method called the, sick, uh, uh, called the disease screening system. Screening means uh, I combine the cross-section comparison with sequential monitoring. Okay, okay. That area, uh, uh, in my opinion, is a new new area with broad applications. I already mentioned many applications. Actually, uh, after I, I gave a talk in the ASA chapter meeting, and uh, in that uh, meeting, uh, some people from epidemiology and other departments <laughs> in the audience, and they are so interested in, the, in this kind of methods, and they already talked to me about the possible collaborations, about uh, monitoring of uh, AIDS and HIVs, this kind of uh, cancers or something like that. So many open problems. Actually, right now, we are writing uh, two more papers on that topic. One is I gave a talk at UC uh, Riverside, and then an uh, associate professor interested in that, and she is right, trying to generalize my method and uh, writing a paper make everything non parametric more general. And then uh, I have uh, a visitor right now. Uh, she's also writing another paper. And uh, they are much smarter than I. So they are, have come up with some uh, uh, more flexible and uh, better ideas to handle uh, this problem. 
and many, but still there are so many different uh, uh, open problems. I already mentioned several. If you are interested in time series analysis, when the times are equally spaced, how to do time series analysis. And if we are interested in a static process control, almost all static process control assume times are equally spaced. If times are not equally spaced, people don't know how to do static process control. So I'm writing another paper for the static process control audience and uh, tell them that uh, uh, in such case, the, uh, the existing, for example, measurements of performance measurements, all those are invalid, we need to modify. And, uh, but in practice, there are so many such applications. Thank you very much. <laughs>